Hey guys, okay, so we are reading chapter number two, The Science of Deduction by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, from a study in Scarlet, and this is the Double Day edition, um, and it's the omnibus edition, so it's a really big book. Anyway, um, we are on chapter two, and in the last chapter, uh, Sherlock and Watson finally met um, with Samford to introduce them. Science of Deduction. We met the next day, as he had arranged, and inspected the rooms at number 221B Baker Street, of which he had spoken at our meeting. They consisted of a couple of comfortable bedrooms and a single large airy sitting room, cheerfully furnished and illuminated by two broad windows. So desirable in every way were the apartments, and so moderate did the terms seem when divided between us, that the bargain was concluded upon the spot, and we at once entered into possession. That very evening, I moved my things round from the hotel, and on the following morning, Sherlock Holmes followed me with several boxes and portmanteaus, meaning like large suitcases. For a day or two, we were busily employed in unpacking and laying out our property to the best advantage. That done, we gradually began to settle down and to accommodate ourselves to our new surroundings. Holmes was certainly not a difficult man to live with. He was quiet in his ways, and his habits were regular. It was rare for him to be up after ten at night, and he had invariably breakfasted and gone out before I rose in the morning. Sometimes he spent his day at the chemical laboratory, sometimes in the dissecting rooms, and occasionally in long walks, which appeared to take him into the lowest portions of the city. Nothing could exceed his energy when work, the working fit was upon him, but now and again a reaction would seize him, and for days on end he would lie upon the sofa in the sitting-room, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. On these occasions I have noticed such a dreamy, vacant expression in his eyes that I might have suspected him of being addicted to the use of some narcotic, had not the temperance and cleanliness of his whole life forbidden such a notion. As the weeks went by, my interest in him and my curiosity as to his aims in life gradually deepened and increased. His very person and appearance were such as to strike the attention of the most casual observer. In height, he was rather over six feet, and so excessively lean that he seemed to be considerably taller. His eyes were sharp and piercing, save during those intervals of torpor to which I have alluded, and his thin hawk-like nose gave his whole expression an air of alertness and decision. His chin, too, had the prominence and squareness which mark the man of determination. His uh, hands were invariably blotted with ink and stained with chemicals, yet he was possessed of extraordinary delicacy of touch, as I frequently had occasion to observe when I watched him manipulating his fragile philosophical instruments. The reader may set me down as a hopeless busybody when I confess how much this man stimulated my curiosity, and how often I endeavoured to break through the reticence which he showed on all that concerned himself. Before pronouncing judgment, however, be it remembered how ob objectless was my life, and how little there was to engage my attention. My health forbade me from venturing out unless the weather was exceptionally genial, and I had no friends who would call upon me and break the monotony of my daily existence. Under these circumstances, I eagerly hailed the little mystery which hung about my companion, and spent much of my time endeavouring to unravel it. It's a very fancy way of just saying he, he couldn't go out because he had, was in bad health, and he didn't have any friends, so something mysterious was, you know, nice to have. He was not studying medicine. He had himself, in reply to a question, confirmed Stanford's opinion upon that point. Neither did he appear to have pursued any course reading which might fit him for a degree in science or any other recognized portal which might give him entrance into the, the learned world. Yet his zeal for certain studies was remarkable, and within eccentric limits his knowledge was so extraordinarily ample and minute that his observations had fairly astounded me. Surely no man would work so hard to or attain such precise information unless he had some definite end in view. Desultory readers are seldom remarkable for the exactness of their learning. No man burdens his mind with such small matters unless he has some very good reason for doing so. His ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge. Of contemporary literature, 
philosophy, and politics, he appeared to know next to nothing. Upon my quoting Thomas Carlyle, he inquired in the naivest way who he might be and what he had done. My surprise reached a climax, however, when I found incidentally that he was ignorant of the Copernican theory and of the composition of the solar system that any civilized human being in this 19th century, so that's the 1800s, guys, should not be aware that the earth traveled around the sun appeared to me to be such an extraordinary fact that I could hardly realize it. You appear to be astonished, he said, smiling at my expression of surprise. Now that I do know uh, it, I shall do my best to forget it. <laughs> to forget it? You see, he explained, I consider that a man's brain is originally is like a little empty attic, and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all lumber of every sort that he comes across, so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out, or is at best jumbled up with a lot of other things, so that he has difficulty in laying his hands upon it. Now the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work, but of these he has a large assortment, and all in the most perfect order. It is a mistake to think that the little room has elastic walls and can distend to any extent. Depend upon it, there comes a time when for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before. It is of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. But the solar system, I protested. What the deuce is it to me? He interrupted impatiently. You say that we go round the sun. If we went round the moon, it would not make a penny worth of difference to me or to my work. I was on the point of asking him what that murk might be, but something in his manner showed me that the question would be an unwelcome one. I pondered over our short conversation, however, and endeavored to draw my deductions from it. He said that he would acquire no knowledge which did not bear upon his object. Therefore, all the knowledge which he possessed was such as would be useful to him. I enumerated in my own mind all the various points upon which he had shown me that he was exceptionally well informed. I even took a pencil and jotted them down. I could not help smiling at the document when I had completed it. It ran in this way. Sherlock Holmes dash his limits. 1. Knowledge of literature. <laughs> Nil. 2. Knowledge of philosophy. <laughs> Nil. 3. Knowledge of astronomy. Nil. 4. Knowledge of politics. Feeble. <laughs> 5. Knowledge of botany. Variable. Well up in belladonna, opium, and poisons generally. Knows nothing of practical gardening. 6. Knowledge of geology. Practical, but limited. Tells at a glance different soils from each other. After walks, has shown me splashes upon his trousers, and told me by their color and consistence in what part of London he had received them. 7. Knowledge of chemistry. Profound. 8. Knowledge of anatomy. Accurate, but unsystematic. 9. Knowledge of sensational literature. Immense. He appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century. So, he's quite smart and knows quite a lot, but he still has limits on his knowledge, right guys? 10. Plays the violin well. 11. Is an expert single-stick player, boxer, and swordsman. 12. Has a good practical knowledge of British law. When I had got so far in my list, I threw it into the fire in despair. If only I could find what the fellow is driving at by reconciling all these accomplishments and discovering a calling which needs them all, I said to myself. I may as well give up the attempt at once. I see that I have alluded above to his powers upon the violin. These were very remarkable, but as eccentric as all his other accomplishment. That he could play pieces, and difficult pieces I knew well, because at my request he has played me some of Mendelssohn's leader and other favorites. When left to himself, however, he would seldom produce any music or attempt any recognized air. Leaning back in his armchair of an evening, he would close his eyes and scrape carelessly at the fiddle, which was thrown across his knee. Sometimes the chords were sonorous and melancholy. Occasionally they were fantastic and cheerful. Clearly they reflected the thoughts which possessed him. But whether the music aided those thoughts, or whether the playing was simply the result of a whim or fancy, was more than I could determine. I might have rebelled against these exasperating solos had it not been that he usually terminated them by playing in quick succession a whole series of my favorite airs as a slight compensation for the trial upon my patience. 
During the first week or so, we had no callers, and I began to think that my companion was as friendless a man as I was myself. Presently, however, I found that he had many acquaintances, and those in the most different classes of society. There was one little sallow, rat-faced, dark-eyed fellow who was introduced to me as Mr. Lestrade, and who came three or four times in a single week. One morning a young girl called, fashionably dressed, and stayed for half an hour or more. The same afternoon brought a grey-headed, seedy visitor, looking like a Jew peddler, who appeared to me to be much excited, and who was mo closely followed by a slipshod elderly woman. On another occasion, an old white-haired gentleman had an interview with my companion, and on another, a railway porter in his velveteen uniform. When any of these nondescript individuals put in an appearance, Sherlock Holmes used to beg for the use of the sitting-room, and I would retire to my bedroom. He always apologized to me for putting me to this inconvenience. I have to use this room as a place of business, he said, and these people are my clients. Again, I had an opportunity of asking him a point-blank question, and again my delicacy prevented me from forcing another man to confide in me. I imagined at the time that he had some strong reason for not alluding to it, but he soon dispelled the idea by coming round to the subject of his own accord. It was upon the 4th of March, as I have good reason to remember, that I rose somewhat earlier than usual, and found that Sherlock Holmes had not yet finished his breakfast. The landlady had become so accustomed to my late habits that my place had not been laid nor my coffee prepared. With the unreasonable petulance of mankind, I rang the bell and gave curt intimation that I was ready. Then I picked a up a magazine from the table and attempted to while away the time with it, while my companion munched silently at his toast. One of the articles had a pencil mark at the heading, and I naturally began to run my eye through it. Goodness gracious, can you imagine getting up and telling your, your landlady that you would like your breakfast now? <laughs> England in that time was very different. Its somewhat ambiguous title was The Book of Life, and it attempted to show how much an observant man might learn by an accurate and systematic examination of all that came in his way. It struck me as being a remarkable mixture of shrewdness and, and of absurdity. The reasoning was close and intense, but the deductions appeared to me to be far-fetched and exaggerated. The writer claimed, by a momentary expression, with a twitch of a muscle or a glance of an eye, to fathom a man's inmost thought. Deceit, according to him, was an impossibility in the case of one trained to observation and analysis. His conclusions were as infallible as so many propositions of Euclid, meaning math and geometry. So startling would his results appear to the uninitiated that until they learned the processes by which he had arrived at them, they might well consider him a necromancer. <laughs> From a drop of water, said the writer, a logician could infer the possibility of an Atlantic or a Niagara without having seen or heard of one of the other. So all of life is great chain, the nature of which is known whenever we are shown a single link of it. Like all the other arts, the science of deduction and analysis is one which can only be acquired by long and patient study, nor is life long enough to allow any mortal to attain the highest possible perfection in it. Before turning to those moral and mental aspects of the matter which present the greatest difficulties, let the inquirer begin by mastering more elementary problems. Let him, on meeting a fellow mortal, learn at a glance to distinguish the history of the man and the trade or profession to which he belongs. Puerile, as such an exercise might seem, it sharpens the faculties of observation and teaches one where to look and what to look for. By a man's fingernails, by his coat sleeves, by his boots, by his trouser knees, by the callosities of his forefinger and thumb, by his expression, by his shirt cuffs, by each of things a man's calling is plainly revealed. That all united should fail to enlighten the competent inquirer in any case is almost inconceivable. What ineffable twaddle! I cried, slapping the magazine down on the table. I have never read such rubbish in my life. What is it? asked Sherlock Holmes. Why, well, this article, I said, pointing to at it with my egg spoon as I sat down with my breakfast. I see that you have read it since you have marked it. I don't deny that it is smartly written. It irritates me, though. It is evidently the theory of some armchair lounger who evolves all these neat little paradoxes in the seclusion of his own study. It is not practical. I should like to see him clap down in a third-class carriage on the underground and ask to give the trades of all his fellow travelers. I would lay a thousand to one against him. You would lose your money, Holmes remarked calmly. As for the article, I wrote it myself. You? Yes. 
I have a turn both for observation and for deduction. The theories which I have expressed there, and which appear to you to be so chimerical, are really extremely practical, so practical that I depend upon them for my bread and cheese. And how? I asked involuntarily. Well, I have a trade of my own. I suppose I am the only one in the world. I'm a consulting detective, if you can understand what that is. Here in London, we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are all at fault, they come to me, and I manage to put them on the right scent. They lay all the evidence before me, and I am generally able, by the help of my knowledge of the history of crime, to set them straight. There is a strong family resemblance about misdeeds, and if you have all the details of a thousand at your finger ends, it is odd if you can't unravel the thousand and first. Lestrade is a well-known detective. He got himself into a fog recently over a forgery case, and that was what brought him here. And these other people? They are mostly sent on by private inquiry agencies. They are all people who are in trouble about something and want a little enlightening. I listen to their story, they listen to my comments, and then I pocket my fee. But do you mean to say, I said, that without leaving your room you can unravel some knot with which other men can make nothing of, although they have seen every detail for themselves? Quite so. I have a kind of intuition that way. Now and again a case turns up which is a little more complex. Then I have to bustle about and see things with my own eyes. You see, I have a, a lot of special knowledge which I apply to the problem which facilitates matters wonderfully. Those rules of deduction laid down in that article which aroused your scorn are invaluable to me in practical work. "'Observation with me is second nature. "'You appeared to be surprised when I told you, on our first meeting, "'that you had come from Afghanistan. "'You were told, no doubt. "'Nothing of the sort. "'I knew you came from Afghanistan. "'From long habit the train of thoughts ran so swiftly through my mind "'that I arrived at the conclusion without being conscious of intermediate steps. "'There were such steps, however. "'The train of reasoning ran. "'Here is a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man. "'Clearly an army doctor, then.' He has just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, and that is not the natural tint of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardships and sickness, as his haggard face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Where in the tropics could any English army doctor have seen much hardship and got his arm wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan. The whole train of thought did not occupy a second. Then I remarked that you came from Afghanistan, and you were astonished. <laughs> it is simple enough as you explain it, I said, smiling. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe. No doubt you think that you are complimenting me in, my, in comparing me to Dupin, he observed. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. That trick of his is breaking in on his thin friend's thoughts with an apropos remark after a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means such a phenomenal as Poe appeared to imagine. Have you read Gaboriau's works? I asked. Does Lecoq come up to your idea of a detective? Sherlock Holmes sniffed sardonically. Lecoq was a miserable bungler, he said in an angry voice. He had only one thing to recommend him, and that was his energy. That book may be positively ill. The question was how to identify an unknown prisoner. I could have done it in twenty-four hours. Lecoq took six months or so. It might be made a textbook for detectives to teach them what to avoid. I felt rather indignant at having two characters whom I had admired treated in this cavalier style. I walked over to the window and stood looking out into the busy street. This fellow may be very clever, I said to myself, but he is certainly very conceited. There are no crimes and no criminals in these days, he said querulously. What is the use of having brains in our profession? I know well that I have it in me to make my name famous. No man lives or who has ever lived, who has brought the same amount of study and natural talent to the deduction of crime, which I have had done. And what is the result? There is no crime to detect, or at most, some bungling villainy, with a motive so transparent that even Scotland Yard official can see through it. I was still annoyed at his bumptious style of conversation. I thought it best to change the topic. I wonder what that fellow is looking for, I said, pointing to a stalwart, plainly dressed individual, who was walking slowly down the other side of the street, looking anxiously at the numbers. He had a large blue envelope in his hand, and was evidently the bearer of a message. You mean the retired sergeant of marines, said Sherlock Holmes. Brack and bounce, thought I to myself. He knows that I cannot verify his guess. 
That thought had hardly passed through my mind when the man who we were watching caught sight of the number on our door and ran rapidly across the roadway. We heard a loud knock, a deep voice below, and heavy steps ascending the stair. For Mr. Sherlock Holmes, he said, stepping into the room and handing my friend the letter. Here was an opportunity of taking the conceit out of him. He little thought of this when he made that random shot. May I ask, my lad, I said in the blandest voice, what your trade may be? Commissioner, sir, he said gruffly, uniform away for repairs. And you were? I asked with a slightly malicious glance at my companion. A surgeon, sir. Royal Marine Light Infantry, sir. No answer? Right, sir. He clicked his heels together, raised his hand in salute, and was gone. So Sherlock Holmes was right, wasn't he? All right, guys, we are on page 25, uh, reading chapter 2 of A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. All right, guys, talk to you later. Bye for now.